Hey folks, this is Ben from Road to VR, and I'm here at Oculus Connect with Max Cohen, who is Oculus's head of mobile, uh, now working largely on the Gear VR, I'd imagine, right? right? Yep. Um, and just beyond Gear VR, is there is there other stuff that you're working on now, whether it be other VR smartphone adapters, other powered by Oculus devices, anything well, you can talk about? We're really concentrated on the Oculus Mobile SDK right now. It's designed for the Note 4. So the Gear VR Innovative Edition is our first mobile product. There will be a lot more coming down the line. But as John mentioned in his keynote today, a lot of what made Gear VR the ability to have it be great VR were some optimizations that he worked on with Qualcomm and with Samsung. And so right now, this device is really top of class in terms of processing power and capabilities. And so that's what we're releasing with first. And so I think Gear VR sets uh, a really great bar for what VR uh, on mobile can and should be. Uh, but there's also kind of a, a scary thing for me watching the industry if you have another smartphone manufacturer just who also wants to be in the space but doesn't really set the same bar for themselves as coming out with something that isn't uh, quite as good. Uh, do, you, do you see a risk in that uh, as far as uh, kind of showing consumers good VR versus bad VR? I think that, uh, that that risk always exists, and, and Oculus has talked about that a lot in the past, that we welcome competition as long as the VR experience is good. We don't want the well to be poisoned, so to speak. Um, but I've been quite impressed with uh, a lot of the other products that are out there, um, especially, and, and John mentioned this again in his keynote about how cardboard was designed to be held up. There's no strap. It's not something to be worn. So it's great at giving you a taste. Um, VR is something that's going to be around for a very long time. That's actually why this is an innovator edition right now, is we're not trying to push too far too fast and sell too many of these. And you see that in our PC product as well, in the announcement of DK1, DK2, and kind of taking this deliberate approach. Um, so obviously that fear is always in the back of our minds. Um, but the reality is, uh, the, I think the market will speak, and I think that um, people who get a good experience will share that with others. And that's what I like most about the Gear VR, is that you can take this and you don't have to sit people in front of a computer, for instance, you can hand it around a room, everyone can try it from where they're sitting and get exposed to it. So I think that the viral coefficient of Gear VR will be very high and it will be most people's uh, first uh, taste of VR. Now with the, uh, the Innovator Edition, that little appended uh, moniker for the first release here, how do you draw the line, where do you draw the line between who should and shouldn't, who this product really is and is not for? Yeah, we say this is aimed at developers and enthusiasts. Um, anyone who wants to buy this can. It's sold online, it's intentionally limiting the distribution channel. Um, there won't be a lot of TV advertising to copy this. That stuff will come in time as the product matures a little bit more. Um, but there will be some hiccups, there will be some bugs. Uh, this is very much a work in progress and so uh, our hope is that there will be some self-qualification of people who want to experience this at the product right now. But the main reason we want to get this out, and especially get it out in people's hands, is there's a wealth of Android developers out there who haven't yet been exposed to virtual reality. Um, and if you ha can do a little 3D, if you can use Unity, Unreal, or some other engines, it's not that difficult to put together a VR experience that runs on mobile. Um, so we're hoping to take both PC developers and have them convert a little bit, but also just uh, expand the overall VR ecosystem. So if you have a mobile developer who's never done VR, they try it out on Gear VR, it's incredibly easy to get that running on the PC if you're using Unity. Um, and so that's something that we hope will actually just uh, create kind of a, a virtuous cycle of just having more and more people get exposed and then excited by virtual reality. Now the... I feel like I've ended every sentence in virtual reality, so... Uh, it tends to happen a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, in... Um, with Gear VR, uh, you have great rotational tracking. The latency is totally impressive uh, compared to everything else that we've seen uh, in the mobile world. Uh, but the lack of positional tracking, I think, you know, for me and for other people, is uh, it's a little bit scary. Uh, for me, positional tracking really improves the comfort factor. Uh, but without it on Gear VR, I, I wonder whether or not um, it'll hit other people with the, a bit of sickness as it, as it does me, you know, just like the DK1. Um, so, was, so on the Gear VR when you tried it, did you feel the need to move or did you feel uncomfortable at all? I, I did feel a little bit uncomfortable just like in the DK1 where it's not enough that I want to leave, but yeah. I just, you know, the tiny little movements that you do this way and that way mm -hmm. end up adding to a Wh sense of What about of in the Gear VR when you tried it? It, it was in, this, in Gear VR, yeah, it was okay. like that for me. Oh, interesting. Okay, so um, it, this really comes down to content. Content needs to be developed in certain ways where you don't want to have near field objects too close that makes you want to lean in and look at it, for instance. Um, but what I can say is that people train themselves really quickly. We find even at Oculus, we go back and forth between using DK2 and using uh, Gear VR. 
And what we'll find is if you've been using DK2 for a while and you go into Gear VR, yes, you, you think you can do that movement and you quickly realize you can't and then you're fine. But if you go from using Gear VR to using DK2, you have to almost remind yourself that you can actually move. So I think after kind of that initial experience, people are pretty good at acclimating to understanding the limitations of the device. But yes, you're absolutely right. Positional, we've talked about six degrees of freedom a long time. It's important. We will get there very soon. Another reason why this is an innovative edition. Um, it, with future products, we will expect to solve that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems like the most obvious way to do that would be with computer vision, but that's such a hard problem. Are you looking at any other approaches other than just you know using some onboard camera for positional tracking going down the road? Yeah, we're looking at lots of approaches. I mean, this is an area of intense research for us. Uh, we don't we don't have a solution yet, but um, we have a lot of ideas. We're working with partner companies as well to try to try to figure something out on this. One thing I will say about the positional tracking, though, is uh, some of the most compelling Gear VR experiences are actually on the video side, and with video, positional tracking wouldn't help because you've got a, just a stable camera, and um, whether you're in Crescent Bay or DK2, when you tried to move, it would actually be the same thing because the image can't update. So we think that those 360 3D videos, and we have this uh, intro to VR from Felix and Paul Studios and Cirque du Soleil's Arcana's in there, um, we think that those things are going to be really compelling on the mobile device. And so do you see, uh, with those videos, which I, I saw the intro to VR, that was pretty cool. I thought that was really neat. Um, it was a, kind of a shorter experience. Do you think mobile is, is better for your uh, brief little experiences rather than an hour gameplay session? Uh, unequivocally so. So uh, I'm going to mention that a little bit. We have a getting started with Gear VR session later today. And uh, I'm going to talk about how mobile is really designed for five to 20 minute experiences. That doesn't mean they can't be incredibly engaging, that you put dozens of hours into. I can't count how much time I've spent in Candy Crush right now. Uh, but it's usually in a five minute chunk. And uh, mostly there's other issues on the mobile device, such as um, battery life, for instance, and uh, making sure the clock speeds aren't running too high so we don't run into thermal issues. I mean, this is, like I said, a work in progress. Um, so yes, by nature, these experiences will be shorter. You're not going to be sitting in, like you do in DK2, in Elite Dangerous and flying a spaceship for three hours. That's not going to happen on, the, on Gear VR. So Gear VR at this point is considered powered by Oculus. Can you elaborate a little bit on what that means? Sure, I think it just speaks to the collaboration between Samsung and Oculus. I would say that mainly Samsung does the hardware and mainly Oculus does the software. Uh, there's collaborations on both sides of that as well. Um, and so this is just a, a, a moniker that I think shows kind of how it is a Samsung produced device. It's called Gear because it's part of the Samsung wearable family. Um, but it's really our technology. When you put this on, you're in Oculus at that point. For developers out there, they work with Oculus. They use the Oculus Mobile SDK. They work with our Oculus Developer Relations team. They use the Oculus Forums. So the developer experience is going to be fully with the Oculus team, but the hardware is made by Samsung. Now, will there be a future going forward where right now it only works with the Note 4? Um, will there be a future going forward where this can work with more devices? It seems very specific now, you know, in terms of the work you've had to do getting deep into the operating system. Is that going to be opened up to other devices? Yeah, it goes back to your first question about uh, making sure that it's, it's good VR. And we hold ourselves to that same standard. So we could have been backwards compatible with the S5, uh, Note 3, S4, and so on. Um, but that wouldn't have made sense for our customers because I know people say, oh, I don't want to go buy a Note 4. Um, the reality is if your device has an older chipset, it's going to be slower. You also don't want bad VR. So um, this is kind of the highest bar, or the, I guess the, the lowest bar we can exceed at this point. And as time goes on, now that we know that this baseline is fantastic, we'll continue to expand and add more devices. But you won't see us adding backwards compatibility to existing devices on the market. Can you talk a little bit about how the relationship between Oculus and Samsung started and, and maybe when uh, you guys started to collaborate? Sure, so this, um, I, I think this has been spoken about a little bit by Brendan as well, but uh, this goes back to, uh, we always thought Samsung made great screens and um, wanted to talk to him about that, and they had been working on some mobile prototypes and wanted to talk to us about that. And uh, there was a lot of skepticism, internally and externally, that it could be done well, and, and John and his team uh, at Oculus started working on it and showed that it actually can be a really neat experience. So this has been a long time in the making. Um, it's been a ton of hard work, it's been a lot of trips to Korea and vice versa, um, and uh, there have been some things that look like deal breakers at various parts that, uh, as John said, once you have that existence proof, you can kind of break through and do it. Um, so it, it, this is something where it's not like we deliver code to Samsung and they ship us hardware. Um, we have people working hand in hand every single day. In the morning when I wake up, I've got 15 emails from different people at Samsung. When I go to sleep, I've got a different 15 because um, of the time difference. And so this is, uh, a collaboration is almost underselling what is actually going on here. 
And a uh, final question, which you may or, not, may or may not be able to answer. Uh, how much that will it cost? I probably can't answer. And when will we see it? Yeah, so uh, both of those are up to Samsung. Um, you will find that out very soon, though. I mean, this is a product that uh, I think what they've said is it will be out this year. Um, we, we've announced that we're going to be releasing our mobile SDK in October and try to do it on the early end of that and make it available to everyone. It's in, it's in kind of preview right now. Um, but developers will be able to use their DK1s or DK2s to develop for Gear VR as well. And uh, we're just excited that you, there's a couple dozen experiences so far, and we're excited to see what everyone can go out and make. A uh, quick follow-up to that also, so when a, if you can develop with your DK1, can you develop a game that is seamlessly published to both through the Oculus platform? Yeah, so, um, I mean, what I think, as Nate said today, what we're going to do is we're going to launch the Oculus platform first on Gear VR, and then we're going to launch that on PC as well. So eventually there will be one Oculus platform. I think we'll, we'll still have share for the PC side um, initially. So it, I don't know about seamlessly. You might have to submit it twice, but that will go away. Yes, the idea is that if you have a game, two different versions that work on mobile and PC, we want to make it as painless, be as developer-friendly as we can. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Max. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks a lot.